Hi, everyone. I'm Bill Pito, and it's great to have you with us for the MSG 150 at Home presented by Chase. This is Patrick Ewing Week on MSG, as we've been paying tribute to the Knicks legend by replaying some of the greatest moments of his career. And now, a special treat as Alan Hahn goes one-on-one -on -one with one of the greatest Knicks of all time. You look great, and I know a couple of weeks ago you announced that you, you contracted the coronavirus. You look like you're doing fine. You look like you're feeling good. I mean, everything all right with you health-wise? Yes, health-wise, I'm doing well. Um, you know, yeah, I, I, con I contracted the, the coronavirus, and, you know, it was surprising because I was doing everything that, every, you know, you're supposed to do, socially distance, you know, wear a mask when you go out. Uh, the only place I was going into is uh, the drugstore, the grocery store. Every now and then I get bored, so I go for a ride. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, people need to take this thing serious because uh, anybody can catch it. And you could be still doing the right things and still catch it. So it's scary. What were the symptoms that you dealt with? Like, what did it feel like? Um, you know, I felt like I, was, I, was, I, I had the flu. First, I thought I was coming out with a cold. So I started doing the things, you know, uh, to take care of a cold. The vitamin C, uh, you know, I've taken echinacea, just a lot of different things to, uh, to, to fight the cold. But it kept getting worse. So after the third day, I, I called my doctor. and You know, she's like, she told me to uh, let's go get tested. So we went and got tested, and then we found out that I was positive. So, you know, I was in the hospital. Uh, they let me go that day. Um, but then... I couldn't breathe very well, so they, they brought me back in. I was in the hospital for five, for five days, and, you know, thank God I started feeling a lot better. You know, I, um, you know, I have to, you know, applaud uh, all, the, all the essential workers, not only the ones at Georgetown Hospital where I was at, but just all over the country who's been doing a fantastic job of, of trying to keep people safe or, or get people better. This week, we're celebrating Patrick Ewing week. We're celebrating you. In fact, I'm celebrating it with your sneaker right here up on my shelf. <laughs> my favorite pairs that, that I have of your Ewings from back in the day. <laughs> but So let's talk about your career and the memories that you have from your career. And, and I got to take it all the way back to draft lottery day. And everybody knows that story. The first lottery in NBA history, the drawing and everything else. Where were you? And what were you thinking when you saw that the Knicks were the team that were going to get you? I was on, uh, on Georgetown's campus, uh, was sitting in Coach Thompson's office, uh, myself, Coach Thompson, my agent, David Falk, uh, Mary Finland, um, and just going through the process. Uh, when, once you know, it came down to the Knicks or Indiana, I'm like, please let it be New York. Please. Um, you know, nothing against Indiana, but I would have rather been in, uh, in New York. Um, in New York won. Uh, I was very happy. I know that there was a lot of fans that were also happy. Season tickets, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I think they might have set, uh, set a record in terms of uh, uh, season tickets uh, sale that day. Um, but no, it was, it, was, it was great. When Dave DeBusher had your jersey already made, I guess it was pretty much a given, right? You knew you were going number one. There was no doubt about it. <laughs> well, I knew I was going number one. I just didn't know where I was going to be going. <laughs> so your first game as a pro, NBA debut at the Garden was against a Hall of Famer, Moses Malone. I mean, you, you had, had to bring that up, huh? You had, well, I'm saying, like, <laughs> baptism by fire. You're going up against Moses Malone. Hey, your first points were a dunk, so right. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty cool. But facing him, facing Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, I mean, you, you step into the league where big men, you know, really ruled the, the game, and you're facing off against a Hall of Famer like that right out of the gate. Do you remember that game, and what do you remember from it? Oh, yeah, I remember. I definitely remember that. Uh, just like you said, my first point, my first two points was a dunk. Uh, came over Moses' back, dunked it, and then he kicked my butt for the rest of the game. <laughs> so uh, I definitely, re definitely remember that. Look, you know, you are, you, you are absolutely right. Back in our era, uh, we, they had some dominant big men. Moses, Kareem, Artis Gilmore, you know, Daryl Dawkins. Uh, you know, they had some, uh, some, uh, some great, great talent. Um, you know, so you had to bring your lunch pail and, and, and your heart at if, you know, if you want to play the center position, especially back then. 
Yeah, it was a different kind of game for sure. But a lot of old guys like me look back at the bomb squad teams. So <laughs> Rick Pitino, Stu Jackson, they had those guys shooting tons of threes. And, you know, I would say that group was way before its time considering where the game is today. Right. But you were one of the best shooting big men in the game, yet they didn't let you take those threes. Did you ever say to yourself, you know, you got Trent Tucker, you got Mark Jackson, you got G Gerald Wilkins. Like, they're all taking threes. Johnny Newman's putting up threes. Let me get a couple of threes. Did you ever <laughs> say that? No, I, I, I wasn't even thinking of that. You know, I, I knew where my, my bread was buttered. Um, you know, I could shoot, yes. And, and maybe if I was playing in this era, I probably would have shot more threes. But I got my threes the, the hard way. It's like the end once, but we've yes. talked about this though. You, you, you say today you could be, you'd be a really good stretch five in today's game, wouldn't you? Oh, definitely. Definitely. You know, and then, you know, who the, who they can guard me on the block. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be just outside shooting threes. Yes. I take a few, but then I'm going to, I'm going to dominate you on the inside as well. Well, I remember a three you made and it was a memorable one for me. Uh, and I wonder what if, if it is for you. Game five, 1990, in Boston. You put an end to that run. <laughs> Bird, Mikhail, Parrish, DJ. I mean, that was they were still there. And that game, you had a monster game. 31 points, eight rebounds, 10 assists, four blocks. But that turnaround three in the corner in front of the bench there was, was one I'll never forget. Think about that game. And what did it mean to you? Because especially, that's where you grew up, Boston. Right. It, it meant a lot, you know, because, you know, I grew up there. So I, there were there are a lot of people from Cambridge that was there. Some of them, you know, were, were Nick fans because of me. Some of them weren't. They wanted to rub it in. So, yeah, the Celtics kicked y'all butt again. And they were talking so much trash to me before the game uh, or, you know, the days leading up to the game. Uh, but then we finally beat them. It, it, it was great. I, I think there's a picture of me pointing into the into the stands. And I was pointing to where the section where all, all the people from Cambridge were to telling them to shut up. You know, <laughs> we, we finally kicked your butt. Um, but and then even that 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 shot, you know, um, Oak drove and he threw the he tried to throw the pass to me. It was a bad pass. So I had to go run and catch up to it. And, you know, the shot clock was running down. I just turned and, and raised up and shot it. I was I was very happy that it went in. Um, you know, it was you know, it was a great game uh, against a great, uh, great Celtics team. You know, Mo played the whole game. I think Mo and I played the whole game, but then they took me out with like seconds to go. So it was a total team effort. Um, I'm just, you know, I we I you know, as you know, with the Knicks, we had we had we had moments where we were loved, and then there were moments when we were hated. And, and definitely after that game, we were definitely loved. Yeah, it meant a lot to to have elimination game in Boston. Right. I mean, that that right. was that, that was a and I think that I think that was the the only that was the first and and last time that the Celtics, especially Larry Bird, let 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 Celtics were ever beaten in the first round. Yes, no, that and that ended what what was their run. I mean, that group right. didn't really did anything after that, and you guys did the same thing to the Pistons a couple of years later as well. Put an end to their run right. uh, as well. Not Nick related, but still during your career, you played on the dream team. Right. And I mean, obviously, that's the greatest team ever assembled. No question about it. So my question to you is, and all the legends about the practice and everything, like, what, what, was, what was better as a competitor and as an athlete? The games in the Olympics or the scrimmages in practice? Oh, definitely the scrimmages. You know, we were we were that much superior superior than anybody else that we were playing. So naturally, you know, when you're going against uh, practicing against your peers, people who are just as good as you, some better than you, or people that you want to be better than at some point, that's that the, the, those games were were remarkable. You know, you have, you know, Michael and Magic and Larry, even though Larry was, was a little hobbled at that time, Marcel, David, uh, Charles, uh, Carl, you know, Carl Malone. We were, everybody was battling uh, and not, not only to see how, you know, the, I'm not even going to say uh, their superiority, but how good you can be. You know, am I better than him? 
you know, Mag Michael wanted to, and Magic and the rest of the and, and the rest of the country to know. Now it's my turn. Mm -hmm. You know, Magic had their run. Larry had their run. Now I'm the I'm the new kid on the block. So I think that all of those things, uh, you know, played a, a role in, you know, them talking trash to one another. Michael talking trash to to, to Magic uh, or to Clyde. Charles talking trash to to Carl. All of that, uh, you know, amplified. Uh, the, the the practices. Did you talk trash to David Robinson? Come on. No, I, I, I'm not a trash talker. We just we just went out, and David's not a trash talker. We just went out there and competed. He may not we let, be. We let the other guys do, do all the trash talk. <laughs> <laughs> he may not be, but I've seen you trash talk. So I know there's, I, I know it's in you, but he probably didn't have to get it out of you. But what we did see, though, especially from you coming out of the, the dream team was the best basketball you ever played in your career. Like it, it, it looked to me like you, you got all of the guys that came out of that team all seemed to like their career. I mean, obviously, you know, Charles gets to a finals, like everybody's careers were elevating at that right. point. Um, but for you also as an MVP candidate now for a number of years, you were always in the conversation. Like did that change you at all as a player coming out of that experience of, being around the best players in the world for as long as you were? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Um, you know, when you when you're playing with the best, the best people in the world, either you're going to your game is going to improve and evolve, or it's gonna, it's gonna, uh, or it's not. So, you know, I wanted it and all of us wanted to be and make sure that we we continue on that path of growth. And, you know, playing against those guys and competing against those guys definitely uh, helped my game. Even though, uh, you know, you go, you put it in there that, uh, I, I, you know, I came close. I got robbed, you know, in the MVP uh, uh, voting. I, I should have won an MVP title, an MVP award, I should say, and I should have won uh, an all-star MVP award. But it is what it is. That's life. <laughs> I remember. Hey, don't blame me. I wasn't in the media back then. I was, just, I was trying to well, make you know, the, the media hated me back then. <laughs> they hate everybody in New York. Come on, that's how, goes. <laughs> how close you came was up three two in the finals. After I thought maybe your greatest performance was in Game Five. The numbers you put up in that game are insane. Uh, obviously against a, another Hall of Famer in, in that game. 25 points, 12, block, uh, 12 rebounds, eight blocks as well in that game. But the problem is that most of the country didn't see it. <laughs> watching a, a, a white Bronco on an L.A. freeway. And I got to ask you, because obviously in that moment, you're, you're, you're not paying it. You're worried about winning a championship. You're not focused on what's happening. O.J. Simpson did what. But eventually that had to come into your conscious. When it did, like, did you – like, did you realize the magnitude of what was going on while you're trying to win a championship? Well, we didn't know anything about it because we're, we're on the court playing. I mean, after, yeah, after. You know, and so, uh, yeah, you know, it's crazy. Just like you said, you know, this is uh, us. We're competing for, for a title and against a great team and a great, uh, great uh, opponent and, and a team. And, you know, one of your best games ever – you know, wasn't wasn't seen. They 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 took went from that to watch uh, however long an hour an hour a couple hour chase uh, of a Bronco, but you know that's life. It is what it is. But you know we came close. We you know to me the the game that we lost the, the the game that we lost. People talk about John and how many you know he shot whatever he shot in Game Seven or uh, I think it was. But I think to me we lost it in Game Three. In three. Uh, Sam Cassell, uh, Sam, Sam Cassell yep. hit a huge yep. three uh, to to help them to to win to win that game. If we had won that game, I think I my belief that we would have won the series. You could have won it in the build in your own building right. too. Right. Uh, so John Starr, I talked to John. We did a, a a thing with him similar to this uh, last week or maybe two weeks ago. And we were talking about Game Six, and he played great in that Game Six as well. And you know, I always believe this too. If Hakeem Olajuwon maybe clipped his fingernails that morning, maybe that shot, <laughs> if he doesn't get, get a piece of that shot. He believes that shot was going in. Now, I know you were rolling to the basket at that point. How did you see that play? Well, you know, unfortunately for me, I, I worked in Houston 
for yeah. what, what four years. But to see that over and over again. So I had to see that I had to see that picture <laughs> in in the lunchroom every day. So every day I would get I'd get in there and I would call him and I I can't say the words that I would I would uh, I was <laughs> I would say to him is that I was wide the <laughs> blank open. Why didn't you throw it to me? But no, um, you know. People, people talk all these things about John Starks. And what I love about John Starks is his heart. And as a shooter, you're supposed to, uh, even if you're missing and you're not, you're not rolling, that's, that's just the mindset. You think the next one is going in. Because if you don't, you might as well just stop playing. You have, to, you, know, you have to have confidence in yourself. You have to put in the hours in the gym to believe that even when it's not going, that the next one is going, and the next one is going to fall. Hey, so the last dance documentary that came out, um, I thought, acknowledge your early 90s teams, but I felt like glazed over the most important team that I, everybody believes was built to maybe take down Michael and the Bulls, and I thought that was the 97 team that you guys have. I mean, that team was right there. Uh, when I've talked to other guys on that team, LJ, John, Others, they all believe that if you would have gotten that chance to face the Bulls, that you could have beaten them because you had success against them in the regular season. Do you believe that, too? That's the year of the fight. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do, the bench. Still can't believe that. I, I do I do think that, um, you know, we were built uh, to beat them uh, that year. That was, you know, to me, our, our, best, our best team. You know, unfortunately – that happened, the fight happened. And like you said, I, I didn't step off the, the, on the floor that much. I, I looked and I got back. And it's crazy because years later, I see Shaq doing the same thing. I think he was in LA and he, he didn't get suspended. I'm like, why did I get suspended back then? And he and him not getting suspended now. But you know, this is what it is. That's all I gotta say. I, I'm gonna leave my, my, no, my no I'm not setting it. you up. I'm not setting <laughs> you up about the suspension. I'm. I'm more. It's, it's more about how good that we very good. team was. We, we were very good. Uh, we were very good, and you know, even um, even Miami, uh, Miami, where well, they, they were able to beat us because I got suspended in Game Six. Uh, we came close in Game Seven uh, to to beating them. I'm sorry, we got, uh, we came close in game six. I think John played extremely well that game, but then he and Larry got suspended in game seven. And uh, we just, we just didn't have enough uh, to, to overcome uh, Tim and, and Alonzo. Um, but we, we were loaded that, that, that year. We were, and we were playing extremely well. We were playing extremely well. We were playing uh, together. Um, and it was just unfortunate. Yeah, that's. I think that's a team that gets overlooked a lot when we talk about the great teams that you played on. So tell me what it meant for you to see number 33 go up to the rafters at the Garden, a place that you spent so much time there, but you were one of those guys that also understood the history of the team. You knew Willis Reed, you knew Clyde, like these guys were around and you know, they honor you. Willis Reed always calls you the greatest Nick. You know, I, I know Clyde does it too. They don't even hesitate to say it, that you were the greatest Nick. Your number goes up, and you say something that always resonates with fans. It stays with me, too. And that's you said, I'll always be a Nick. What, what, did, what, did, what did that day mean for you? What did that moment mean for you? It meant a lot. It's like uh, the culmination of, of, of my career. You know, I remember Rick Pitino, uh, uh, when he was a coach there, was saying that the only way you're going to win a uh, be a, get, get your name in the rafters is to to win a championship. So I, I tried my 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 damnness to to get uh, to win a, t- a title, but unfortunately it wasn't in the cards. But I think all not only myself but my teammates, all the blood, sweat, and tears, and and injuries that we we sustained uh, through my 15 years there, you know, gave me the honor to be up there with all those greats. And I do still consider myself a Nick. Um, and, you know, it's funny because when I got traded to Seattle, and after 15 years of, he- of hearing, starting at center, you know, from the New York Knicks, number 30, Patrick Ewing, I, 
from that, that whole year in, in Seattle, I, I kept he, waiting to hear them say from the New York Knicks. And so, that center. Yeah. Right. yeah. So you know, it, it was it's been it's been ingrained in my in my in my in my in my head. But you know, I think that you know, for 15 years, uh, we we had our ups and we had our downs. We had, we started out slow. We and we then we went on a run, a phenomenal run. Unfortunately, we couldn't we didn't cap it off by winning the title. But there's a lot of great people, uh, a lot of great players who one haven't been to, haven't ha had an opportunity to play in the championship game, and then two have not won it. So you know, uh, I was honored to have all my friends, all my peers, my family come back uh, and help me celebrate or close uh, the chapter of of my basketball career. Well, as somebody that grew up a fan of the team and. You all know this. I've told you this many times that I, I idolized you as a player myself. Uh, wanted to play like you did. <laughs> I too, poorly. <laughs> uh, and eventually just lived vicariously through you as, okay, well, that's my guy and that's my team. And, you know, those were the, the great years for, for my generation of watching the Knicks and, and watching you. So, you know, it, it meant a lot to so many people and it still does. So these stories, uh, I think, are fun to relive. And I do appreciate you taking the time to hang out with us here and, and tell some of them. No, my pleasure. I, I send you the bill. <laughs> <laughs>Back on the MSG 150 at home presented by Chase, Bill Pito, Alan Hahn. We say hello to Monica McNutt and Wally Zerbiak. And applause for Alan Hahn. Great job with Patrick Ewing. Well Great interview, Alan. Uh, really, really came off well. Yeah, well, it's my favorite player. It's like, you know, when you talk to your idol, there's two people that were idols I grew up as a sports fan that I met, and they didn't disappoint me. The first one was Bob Nystrom, one of the nicest human beings on the face of the earth, and a guy I idolized. And then Patrick... When I met him, scowl and all, I don't care. You see right through it. I told him that from the very beginning. I know who you're really about. Like, I know you care. And, and, I, and I love the guy. And you can see the sneaker I put right here behind me uh, for him. And, and just to get him to smile and laugh, that's his sneaker, the, the Patrick Ewing sneaker. But uh, for me to be able to talk to him on that level and to reminisce like that, and boy, I'll tell you what, guys, you can see the smile on his face and the way he talked about some of the memories of his, of his Nick days. And I love what he said about 97 and how he feels like that team could have beaten the Bulls, that he certainly felt like they were set up for it. But that incident happened with the Heat, and we'll never know. But he's pretty fierce about that. We had our chances that year. Patrick Ewing. That's all I remember growing up as a kid. Mike Walczewski on the mic announcing Patrick Ewing. He gave his heart and soul to the Knicks and to the New York fans. Uh, I mentioned it the other day. He was all about New York basketball. But what I love about Patrick Ewing's story is what he's become after his, his basketball playing career. This is the guy, and this is why he was so great. Basketball is in his blood. I mean, he worked his butt off as an assistant coach. Now he got the opportunity to be a head coach at your alma mater, uh, Monica. It's also where my brother went and my uh, sister-in-law. They went both, we both went to Georgetown, a phenomenal university. And now he has the opportunity to show uh, and, and, and impart his wisdom and his basketball wisdom on youngsters. I think he's, he's in a great place personally. That says a lot about him as a person, because not only was he a great player when he was making millions and millions of dollars, he's also become a great person, a great coach, a great teacher in his retirement. And that says a lot about him as a person, because a lot of guys can't figure out retirement after basketball. Patrick Ewing sure has, guys. It's so funny to me to hear the stories of him and his the peak Nick days or even the scout like you talk about him because when I met Big Pat as we called him because I was on campus with Little Pat like he was always this big teddy bear he was so gracious and I'll never forget one year at the men's basketball award ceremony at the end of the season somebody one of the alums made the mistake saying that I want to maybe it was Dikembe I can't remember who but someone other than Patrick was responsible for the Big East. And Big John got up and made it super, super clear that the Big East is a product of the basketball that Patrick Ewing brought to Georgetown, period. And he didn't want to hear any other names. So everywhere Pat has been, he has left a legacy that is larger than life. All right, guys, as always, our friends at NYU Lango and Health provide us the guidelines to stay healthy and safe. Thanks for watching the MSG 150 at home presented by Chase. See you next time, everybody. <laughs>